I am not an angel. I'm saved by grace. Trust me when I say I have made some mistakes. God's mercy is my covering. Had to fall on my face. Just take a look around. God's judgment is hitting this place. Lord, keep us from falling and dying in our sin. I am grateful that you didn't give up on me. The enemy won't win. Hello and welcome back to the Confidence Restored podcast. I am your host, Tamiria Jordan. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for your support. If you have not subscribed, please hit the subscribe button so that you never miss an update. But I am here today to talk about sinning on Saturday, saved on Sunday. So (laughs) y'all, when I tell you, I have been getting so many messages today and I'm like, whew, I am so full. And so I will start off by saying, God, give us grace to give more grace because what we see happening in the news, we see, um, I will say fighting amongst the church regarding like beliefs. So Colossians 3.13 tells us, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And when I think about the gift of grace, it is truly that a gift, a gift, because grace is unmerited favor. We don't deserve God's grace. We all have fallen short um, from the glory of God. But I think where people are getting confused right now with what we're seeing happening is the fact that there have been some prophetic messages released just talking about what is to come and or what is currently happening. So some of those prophetic messages were released long before any situations ever surfaced, but now we're seeing things come to light. So I will talk on, talk about some of that as well, but I really just wanted to at a high level, just talk about the fact that even for myself, when I was young in my walk, I will say I was that same person sinning on Saturday, saved on Sunday. So Saturday in the club, Sunday in the church. And now what we say is sinning on Saturday is sinning every other day of the week. But then on Sunday, all of a sudden we come back to where we feel we need to be. And so um, what dropped in my spirit earlier this afternoon is what I believe is a bombshell for believers and non-believers alike. And it is people get up in arms about certain sins, except those sins that they are not engaged in. And the reason I say that is because I feel like it is very true. People worry about who's sleeping with who who's doing what, who's saying what, but yet they don't take a look in the mirror and look at their own sin. And so we get into these unfruitful discussions and or arguments on social media and what have you, where people are upset and they're talking about what someone else is doing, but yet they don't want to acknowledge their own mistakes. So It's one of those things now where I feel like God is in a place where he's calling us to repentance and really calling us to be who he has called us to be. And while you may have been following me for a while and you've heard where I've said, like, you know what, we need to live life unapologetically. That doesn't mean that we have a license to sin. That doesn't mean we can do what we want to do. That doesn't mean that we can say what we want to say because it's God's grace that is saving us today. And so earlier this week, um, I ended up hearing a prophecy. And this prophecy was from the Master's Voice Prophecy blog. And in that particular blog, the prophetic word was giving out warnings against what we are now seeing happening in the church. So there being a falling away. And so when we think about that, and we think about idols and we think about how we may idolize people, how we may look at people. And to a degree, we get mad at the prophecy. We get mad at the prophets, but then we don't get upset at the things that we see. So if we see things that are happening that are not biblical, things that are um, we know for a fact are not of God, things that would um, 
essentially seek to embarrass, <laughs> I will say the church, because people are turning away from God because of church hurt. And I always say, you can't judge God off the actions of man. We all have free will, don't you understand? So meaning we all have free will. We all have the opportunity to make certain decisions. We all have an opportunity because of grace to go back to God. But when I think about even my own life, I realize that I too have been judgmental, especially um, early in my faith. And I will say that um, the Bible tells us not to judge because the same way that we judge others is the way in which we will be judged. And when I say that hit me like a ton of bricks now, I totally get it because I say to myself, you know, the way that some of the big names, the people that we've been following for years, we see them falling from grace in the public eye. And so when we think about this cancel culture idea and things of that nature, individuals have to work out their own salvation in fear and trembling. So they have to work out that salvation with God. But I think where people get confused is with regard to prophecy, they feel like, okay, well, because people are working out their salvation with God, that if God gives someone a message to warn the public or to warn the people that they should not share that message. And so I always say this is so much bigger than us. We can ignore the warnings if we want to, but we will also have to deal with our own decisions, exposure, et cetera, because if we don't truly repent, the person that we're responsible to is not other people. We are responsible to God. So regardless if this is a personal opinion or what have you, we have to remember that we have a responsibility and we also have choices and decisions to make. And Bishop Dale Bronner said, um, while eulogizing a friend, that we're born looking like our mamas and daddies and we die looking like our decisions. And that in and of itself is powerful. It's a gut punch because we make certain decisions. So today, earlier, I was cooking, right? And so I... um Typically, if someone spills something on the floor, I'm always like either my husband or my daughter. I'm like, OK, make sure that you pick that up. And you may have seen a little head in the back. Now, she knows she's supposed to be in bed, but um, I'll have to talk to her about that. So anytime that something spills, I'm always like, OK, you all, you need to make sure that we clean it up because we don't want to have any insects or anything like that because they're attracted to like the sweet smells or what have you. So today when I was cooking, I had made, I was making, I should say, because I had made it at that point, some French toast. Well, I, while trying to move some of the things around on the countertop, ended up grabbing the bread and the bread knocked over the bowl. And so it hit the floor. And now it hit the floor and both my husband and my daughter, they were upstairs, they were sleeping. And what was crazy is I proceeded to wipe it up. And as I bent down to the floor to wipe up the mess that I made, I made, <laughs> I have to preface that I made, I had a thought and I said, oh my gosh, thank you, Lord, for revelation, because that is what we're seeing today. We are seeing people's messes on a public stage, the mess that they may have made. Now, mind you, it may have taken years for this to come to fruition and to come to light, but they know what they've been doing behind closed doors, but other people don't. How many of us? So I made the mess earlier. Neither my daughter nor husband would have been the wiser about what happened because I cleaned it up. I was able to wipe it up. I was able to cover what I did when I knocked over that bowl. But yet, if they had knocked over that bowl in front of me, I would have been like, oh, you know, you have to clean that up. We don't want this mess on the floor. And I thought to myself, this is the same thing that we're seeing in the church. Literally, because we, some of us can hide behind closed doors, we can clean up our mess without anyone knowing, then we think we got a pass. So when my husband came downstairs, I was like, oh, I have to tell you what happened because a few days ago he had spilled something. And of course, like I went in to help and clean up the floor, but then to a degree, I guess you could say it was like a little lecture, but I was like, oh yeah, just so you know, this is why I always say X, Y, and Z. And I'm not trying to be funny, but it was like, I wanted to make sure that he knew why I was saying what I was saying, right? But then I got convicted today because I said, look, you just feel something and you were able to clean it up. Now, I didn't have to tell him that I made the mess. I didn't have to tell him what happened because he was asleep. But 
I chose to be like, you know what? Earlier today, I spilled this, and this was the revelation I had, is that just like what we see happening in the church, people want to sin on Saturday or sin any other day of the week, and then they want to be saved when they get up in the pulpits. But even the word reminds us that those who teach the word will be held to a higher standard. And whether we want to believe it or not, whether we want to receive it or not, um, and the words of Lanika Scott, she said, the Bible is the standard, not other people's opinions. And I wholeheartedly agree. We want to hide. And so when we live for God, we're called to be different. And living for God is hard, especially in this day and time where there's so much temptation. It's so easy to be like, you know what? No one will know. They won't see. I think there was a um, a TikTok or something, something and they were like, nobody will know. They will never know. And that's how we live. It's like, you know what? They will never know what I did on Saturday. But then when I go to church on Sunday, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And so I was that person. I don't know how many altar calls y'all I went to because I literally was always at the altar. And so when I think about even the book that I wrote, Sins, Salvation is the New Sexy, um, I knew that the title would ruffle feathers, right? But that was intentional because I said society, especially American society, we are so, I think it's an imbalance because we are so surrounded by um, engulfed in sin and encouraging people to be sexy and be who they are. And there's nothing wrong with feeling good about yourself and feeling beautiful. That's not what I'm saying at all. But when I looked up the etymology of the word sexy, when you look at the word sex, if you see on a job application, the word sex, you don't feel any kind of way. You know that they're talking about males and females in the way that it was on job applications before you would get two options, you select male or female. So in the late 14th century and before, the word sex referred to gender, so male or female, based on our our anatomy. But then in 1905, that is when the term changed. So in the 20th century, the 1905, they added the dash Y. Now dash Y by itself means characterized of. So if you add sex from the 14th century plus the dash Y, characterized of, sexy simply meant being characterized of a man or a woman. However, it wasn't until that time that it became labeled as engrossed in sex. So it went from referring to the physical anatomy of males and females to meaning engrossed in sex. And so it also changed meaning again in 1912 to mean the sense of being, aka sexually attractive. And so as we think about the etymology of the word, Words have power, and oftentimes we are the ones who give the words power. And so in the 1950s, the word added a new connotation and or definition, which meant appealing, liable to excite interest, not boring, and is still used in marketing today. So you might hear like, oh, this marketing is sexy, this water is sexy, this billboard is sexy, whatever it is. And so when we think about 1 Peter 4, and I'm going to read the whole chapter because I think it's worth reading. But the first one or the first section is living for God. So again, we go from living in sin to, I will say, because we're saved by grace, attempting to live a righteous life. But I'm like, God, give me the grace to live right. Because according to me, I, I will mess up every time. But it's a gift of grace and mercy. And that is in Romans 9, where it says, God has mercy on whom he chooses to have mercy on. So in First Peter 4, living for God, starting in verse 1, it says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert 
and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If someone, or excuse me, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And then it goes into what it means to suffer for being a Christian. Starting in verse 12, First Peter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, listen. It is hard even for the righteous to be saved. What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So when I say, I was like, wow, this is powerful because I thought about the fact that it is God's grace. It is God's mercy that saves us. So no one technically can talk about anyone else and or, you know, pretend that we are not with sin or have not been with sin or have not been in sin at some point in our lives. I think we just have to realize that we shall not let the enemy go to God on our behalf. It is time for us to repent while we still have time and turn away from our sin and really ask God to help us because in and of itself, we are mere humans. And so when we hear prophetic words, when we hear warnings from individuals that God has called up to help us during these tough times, sometimes people want to get mad because it's highlighting their sin. It's highlighting that, you know what, something you're doing is not right. It's not proper. And those words, I think it's important for us to understand why prophetic words matter and why God has blessed us to be able to hear from individuals who can warn us. And so I shared about a day ago on social media, you may recall the viral TikTok video when the gentleman says, you want to argue? I can't argue with you. You mad. I can't argue with you. And then it keeps going. (laughs) And I like to say, I'm no longer going to argue with words. I'm going to go to the word. And so in John 3, it says, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Again, sinning, and I use the analogy of sinning on Saturday to essentially mean sinning on every other day except for Sunday. And then we want to praise God and think that one day our sin won't be exposed. So I am telling you now, Lord, I repent. In our repentance, our salvation should be worked out with God. And it says, work out your own salvation. Um, with fear and trembling. And that is in the word. And I'll give you all the scriptures that's in Philippians two. So it talks about us working out our own salvation, going to God and asking him for forgiveness. So it says, therefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so when we think about working on our own, working out, excuse me, our own salvation, we should not be um, as concerned with other people as I think sometimes we are, but that does not mean that God cannot bring forth a prophetic word. And so when I think about that, I think what right now people are getting the two confused and they think that someone sharing a prophetic word is judging someone else, but they're sharing what thus saith the Lord. So if God gives them a word to share, 
that's what they're doing. They're doing their part. Like in First Peter 4, if God gives you a gift and tells you to do something, it's up to us to do it. It says, if anyone speaks in First Peter 4, verse 11, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. And that's one example. But the Bible says that from a prophetic standpoint, you will know them by their fruit. So if you think about it, We cannot will, we cannot pray another person to repent. It is a personal decision. But I see a lot of people saying, you shouldn't be talking about them. You should pray for them. You can pray for them. But at the end of the day, we cannot will another person to repent. It's a personal decision. And like it says in Philippians 2, everyone has to work out their own salvation and fear and trembling. Like that's just what it is. We cannot um, expect to pray someone else is sent away. That's not how that works. So um, it is important that we focus on those things. Now, what I will say is I am grateful for who God is and who he's made me to be. But I will say that it's important that we understand and appreciate those who God has blessed to bring forth those prophetic warnings. And so I will record at another time, like how to know um, if someone is truly a prophet sent by God, because the word tells us how to know. And at at a high level in Matthew 7, 20, it says, wherefore by their fruits, ye shall know them. So I just encourage you all to look at people for their fruit. Because in second Peter one, it says for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets though humans spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy spirit. So I do think right now what we're seeing is prophecy, but we're also seeing people People get upset because of the prophecy due to the fact that they have now idolized people. And so people bring the word, but people are not the word. People are not God. People don't have a heaven or a hell to put you in. So the importance here is that we focus on working out our own salvation, but we also appreciate God's conviction and God's correction. So I hope that this message has really encouraged you all. Um, we will definitely come back and talk about prophetic warnings and appreciating them for what they are. But thank you for tuning in. And until next time, keep on keeping on. <laughs>